I've called you all here today to discuss the future of our great empire. Our goal would be to conquer all of Calradia. Any thoughts on how to best accomplish this? Why don't we go to war with Flandia first? Our men need more butter. It's almost harvesting season. How about war with the Kuzids? Our men need companionship more than food, and I hear they have the sexiest sheep in all the lands. Batania is the weakest kingdom, and while their women can't compare to those mm, irresistible Kuzid sheep, conquest will be much easier. Tynaut, what say you? Mm. According to this ancient warfare manual, the key to winning battles is F1, F3. Shut up, all of you idiots. I'll tell you the secret to success. We must attack everyone at the same time. David! Why is everyone so stupid? In this episode, we'll be taking control of the recently united empire and saving the nobles from themselves. In the last episode, Menteos went to war with many kingdoms on multiple fronts and nearly lost everything. This time, however, we'll be controlling all war votes, policy votes, promoting and recruiting new clans, and setting aggression stances for each war we're in. Let's jump right into it. First order of business, pass four policies. Castle charters decreases build time of buildings and works for both towns and castles. So until they fix it, we'll take advantage. Of it. Forgiveness of debts grants two loyalty per fief at the cost of 5% tax income. Higher loyalty grants a bonus to tax income anyway, so oftentimes this policy pays for itself. Tribunes of the People is similar to the previous policy, but only grants one loyalty. With both of these active, we negate the minus three loyalty penalty for all of our vassals who own a non-culture matching fief. And finally, Noble Retinue grants plus 40 troops for the leader's clan party once they reach clan tier five. We'll need all the men we can muster. It's time to discuss our first target of the campaign. Unlike Menteos, we won't be attacking everyone at the same time. Most kingdoms have five to 6,000 troops and all share a border with us, so it really doesn't matter which one we pick first. Let's deal with the Asurai first since it's much easier to defend holdings there after we take them. Let's start with an offensive war strategy since we'll be focusing entirely on a single target at a time. Since we're only in one war, our parties flock to the first siege of Garantor Castle and easily rebuff the enemy. These small parties parties keep their movement speed and really pile on the enemy quickly. After only a few battles, we've already reduced the Asterize number down from 6,000 to 4, most of these being garrison troops. Things are about to go nuts. Let's switch to the map. Batania declares war and we immediately sue for peace. Your time will come soon enough, Towers. First blood comes when our boys take Shabal Zumur Castle. We're going to focus on promoting companions at the start to manage these fiefs in order to avoid the minus three loyalty hit. They only start with clan tier two, three clan members, and a single party to contribute to the war. But over time, they will become very powerful. Tamna Castle falls only four days later. Tubulus Castle is taken on the other side of the kingdom, so we promote a second asteroid vassal to manage it for us. Once again, because we're in a single war, our vassals have swarmed the enemy armies trying to take Tubulus back. Kusin Folk, the proud city of the east, falls to our might, and the shenanigans begin. Our nobles want war with Batania, but we turn it down. Two days later, they want war with the Kazates. Don't worry boys, you'll have your sheep soon enough, but now is not the time. Kuyaz is next to fall. It doesn't seem the Asurai have a response to our blitz tactics. Einbelik Castle falls a week later, followed by Ukba Castle days after that. Manteos wants war with the Butterlord, but we deny the request. Razik falls, and they only have a handful of towns left in their kingdom. Kubiar falls in the spring, and since our asteroid vassals are already bloated with fiefs, we promote a third companion. Then it finally happened. We took Jemia Castle a day later, Einbelik Castle the day after that, then finally lost Einbelik back to the Asurai. It seems they are still capable of defending. No, stop it. No war with Sturgia. Iaki's falls, and it's time to promote the final Asurai vassal. The plan is to have all four promoted companions hold the entirety of the Asurai kingdom. Of course, right before the end of the year, the men are desperate. They can't have their sheep, so they try to settle for Batania women, but we turn down the vote. This concludes the first year. We haven't completely destroyed the Asurai, but there isn't much left to go, and there 
irreparably damaged at this point. We promoted four asteroid companions to handle the conquests, and it'll be interesting to see how these clans progress through to the end. Once again, we're looking at total nobles living and dead each year. 16 nobles came of age in the first year, with only five deaths. One thing I failed to mention in the previous episode is that living nobles represents the net gain, meaning it takes into consideration the ones that died as well. If we add back in the deaths, the nobles actually increased by 21 the first year, but five died as well, bringing the net gain to 16. Looking at the Empire clan stats, two clans increased their clan tier in year one, two more nobles joined their ranks, and an incredible 12 fiefs were added to the kingdom. What a massive difference from the AI only run. Year two begins with our vassals spending war votes again. We downvote the Vlandia war to start. Medini Castle falls a few days later and the noose tightens. Kazate declares war and our men rejoice, only to be let down when we pass the peace immediately after. Sorry for the blue balls, boys. A vote for marshals passes, not the most useful policy. Casira falls and only two towns to the west remain. We can't let up now. No peace with Asarai until they have no more land. And no war with Vlandia. We lose Ein Balik Castle back to the Asarai somehow. Okay, all these war votes are are getting annoying. We take Barihal Castle, then Ein Balik a few days later. It's like two war votes for every one fief we take. This is crazy. Askar falls, and they are left with a single town now. Two more bad votes are dodged. I saved a couple clips to show you. Here is peak AI prioritization. Our 500 troop army is chasing a 60 unit cavalry only party deep into the desert. Nice. The final town, Sanala, was an easy target, but unfortunately the AI decided to do this instead. It just chased every little party party around, not accomplishing much of anything. And when our troops split up, they would get dogpiled and ripped to shreds by the tiny parties. Looking at the nobles data, most kingdoms expanded by one or two, while the empire expanded by five. Only a single death this time for the Asarai due to old age. We see a big slowdown this year with no increase in clan tier and only four fiefs. The clips from earlier took up close to half of the year. Peak AI efficiency. Let's finish off the Asarai, then speed things up a bit. But first, we have to avoid war with Vlad India for the 20th time. Sahel Castle falls in the east and the Asrai are down to a single town, Sanala. Here we go again. It's been months and the AI is still chasing small groups around instead of attacking so we're forced to form an army of our own to finish the job. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Sorry guys, I broke the rules. I'm going to jail! Sanala falls days later and we sue for peace with the Asarai. Here is the summary for the rest of the year. Batania becomes the next target and loses several fiefs. We promote three new vassals to hold all the Batanian lands and avoid many bad wars and peace votes. Looking at the map, we can see the Batanians have been gobbled up, having only four fiefs left in total. They even took a castle from Sturgia for us, and we hired a Sturgian companion to look after them. Total nobles increased by 22 this year, with Sturgia and Batania making up the bulk. There might have been a rebellion or two that I missed, because because that's a big increase for one year. Deaths rose to five this year with Batania losing five to battles. We stomped them pretty hard, so it's not really surprising. Looking at the Empire clan data, clan tiers rose by 14, but eight of which came from promoting new companions. 13 new clan members joined the ranks, but again, 12 of them came from promoting companions. And finally, we see another strong push with 12 fiefs gained year over year. Year four, we see the conclusion of the Batanian slaughter. Lord Privy Council is passed, more wars and peace votes denied and Sturgia declares war on us right as we finish off the Batanians. Perfect. Looks like the next target picked itself. Sturgia loses several fiefs to close out the year. Nobles barely increased by six, and only three nobles died this time. This is quite a bit slower than the AI ran campaign from the last episode. Very little has changed for clan tier and clan members, and only eight fiefs were taken this year, in contrast to the double digits with previous years. I've noticed as enemies lose more fiefs and are consolidated into a smaller area, our army tends to chase small parties instead of sieging, dramatically slowing down progress. Year 5 saw a first in the campaign. Nine war or peace votes were initiated and turned down, and only eight fiefs were captured, excluding the Tyal Rebellion. The nobles are becoming restless. Road tolls was passed, another useless policy. Let's check out the map difference. It's a beauty. There are only two kingdoms left, and they're at the polar opposites of the world. Things go back to normal here with 14 new nobles coming of age, and six nobles dying. Four died of old age, and two 
Sturgy Nobles from getting curb stomped. Finally, we see our first Asteroid Vassal Clan increasing from Tier 2 to Tier 3. It only took 4 to 5 years to do it. I can only imagine getting to Clan Tier 5 or 6 would take an entire generation of Nobles to do it. Conquest again slowed some with only 7 fiefs being added to our bottom line. The rest of the Conquest is pretty straightforward, but let's look at some interesting statistics before we do the full recap. Peace and War Votes were called 22 times, 20 of which were rejected. Fiefs were taken 24 times from Vlandia and Kuzate, 4 of which were taken, lost, and then taken back. The final Kuzate fief was taken on Spring 4, 1093, which means the whole World Conquest took just under 9 years to complete. Wait a minute! How does Asurai own fiefs? And how the hell did Vlandia take fiefs as well? While we mop up these peasants, let's go over a bug that's currently plaguing the game. According to Flasson, there seems to be an issue with clans defecting from your kingdom regardless of how good they have it. I have max relations with all clans, have close to 1 billion dinars in the bank, and everyone has 3 to 5 fiefs to their name. The balance of power was such that we had 3 times more troops than everyone else in the world combined, and yet they still left. The reason has to do with owning a town that originally belonged to the previous kingdom ruler. We dealt earlier with a Batanian vassal defection and they owned Maranath, Kaladog's home. One of our starting clans was given a town owned by Dirtbag Durthurt and he defected. Then one of our Asurai vassals was given Unkid's hometown and he defected. Here are some mugshots of these bastards. I thought about executing them but the Empire needs to heal at this point so we'll leave them be. Looking at the final data set for nobles we see a very steady increase of roughly 12 per year with no major swings. Comparing this to the AI only data the the numbers are remarkably similar. It makes sense though, since the earliest a noble can be born is the first year of the campaign, and they won't become an adult for 18 years. So new nobles entering the game must either be spawned in from thin air or rebellion clans, again spawning from thin air. However, when we look at the deaths, a completely different story emerged. Deaths seem fairly consistent, only increasing by 20 in 5 years. However, when we compare to the AI only data, the difference is striking. After 5 years, only 44 nobles were dead or 11 since the start. That's nearly double the death rate. Most likely this is coming from our overwhelming army stomping the enemy as well as catching many small parties several times with a chance to kill them each time. Who knew data was so interesting? Moving on to the Empire clan data. Clan tier didn't move much if we exclude the increase from promoting new clans. This makes sense though since we had less than nine years from start to finish and the AI is terrible with renown gain. Likewise clan members didn't change much if we exclude promoted companions. Babies take more than 18 years to come of age from pregnancy to adulthood. And finally, my favorite database from this entire campaign. We started out with a measly 44 fiefs and exponentially grew to over 100 in less than 10 years. Let's compare this data set with that of the 30 year AI only campaign. Not only did we not lose 10 fiefs in the first year, but we gained 12. A 12 fief difference or 50%. That's in a single year. The whole map was taken over in less than 10 years by us and not once in 30 years did the AI have more fiefs than when they started. We have a few things to talk about here. Let's get the map montage rolling while we do it. Looking back at this experiment, two things were immediately clear. The AI has no clue which policies to pass and they can't manage their wars properly. During our player controlled run, we were able to avoid multiple front wars and our clan armies did an excellent job at not only taking fiefs, but also defending them afterwards. And we dealt with no rebellions due to strategic companion promotions and two loyalty policies. I did adjust the war stance a couple times to see if there was a difference, but I wasn't able to notice any. It's possible that a single front war isn't big enough for the AI stance change to have any meaningful effect. I think testing it again with two wars at once would be telling for this. After some thought, it's quite obvious there's a lot of room for improvement with kingdom efficiency. I think it'd be a terrible idea to make the AI as good as a player with enough hours in Bandalore to earn a PhD, but I would like to see some improvements to AI's focus. I'd love to see the AIs run their wars much more defensively in the beginning, not committing to huge sieges that will end in disaster with no chance of defending their conquest after. I also think it'd be amazing if the king's traits affected their behavior. For example, a king with a daring trait would act exactly as the AI does currently, pushing forward no matter the cost. And someone with a calculating trait would be much less likely to commit to battle unless the numbers were in their favor and much more likely to pass amazing policies that bolster loyalty or party size. But how do you know which policies are good? Check out this video next where I test every single policy and rank them from best to worst. Thank you as always to the channel members and Patreon supporters for allowing me to fuel my map porn addiction. I love you all. Since it's much... This concludes the first year. Year, 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 year. Str
Let's go over a bug that's 